Hello, my name is Michelle Morand. I am a precision cancer medicine educator and advocate. I've spent the last 14 years helping cancer patients access the most beneficial therapies for them. And here with me today is Alexander Roland, or as we call him, the cancer guy. Uh, he has spent a lot longer than that educating himself and uh, doctors and patients on uh, the most important diagnostics and treatments that are going to give them the best outcome of their cancer care. Uh, and Alex has created a presentation for us today about elk positive lung cancers and a new treatment that is knocking it out of the park for people. Uh, so share us, share, share, Alex, tell us all about this. Yeah, so this is, um, it's actually a drug that's been out for a while. Um, there's a few elk targeted therapies. Um, and this is a recent FDA approval uh, in this context. Um, ALK stands for anaplastic lymphoma kinase. And it is a gene that gets altered and mutated in uh, some lung cancers. So uh, crizotinib is an ALK inhibitor that has been used as standard of care for ALK mutated lung cancers for some time. It's what we call the first generation ALK inhibitor. Uh, a side note on crizotinib, um, it's been actually around for quite some time, approved by FDA in 2011, Europe 2012, but uh, did not appear in Canada till about 2015, which is about four years after the FDA approval. And they began their review in 2013. So a slow process in Canada, we got to improve things. Yeah, it, uh, that is really common, that great, you know, the four to five years. I mean, we, we've seen it take 10 for, for some excellent therapies to just get, you know, get some uptake. And then from there, it, it takes even longer for each of the individual provinces and the different cancer agencies and then the doctors to kind of pick up the ball and run with it. So the more educated you are as a patient or an advocate, the faster all this stuff happens. And on that note, um, typically when a new drug comes out, uh, the drug maker will uh, provide it to Canada free of service for about a year or, or so. And that's usually when the drug is easiest to access because it's through the drug maker and there's no restrictions or paperwork or anything. You can just apply for it and you get it usually pretty well, quick. Well, there is a little paperwork, but it's not a lot. It's just Gosh. a couple a couple of signatures. Um, yeah. yeah, so those compassionate access programs are when the pharmaceutical companies are seeking to get approval in that particular area are a really um, excellent way for you to get access to these new therapies. We digress, but with intent, because that's an important little piece of information for you. So um, while this drug, Prisotinib, does provide uh, benefits, um, patients become resistant to it. Now, there's a there's a bunch of different mechanisms that cause resistance to crizotinib. They're called emerging resistance mutations, but they may also be pre-existing uh, mutations. But typically, um, you know, the key molecular features are what we call the EML4 ALK fusion, variant 3, um, and P53 mutations. And um, these sort of um, mutations or, you know, um, desensitizing mutations, as I like to call them, can actually result or influence uh, the whole process of mutational development and result in a specific ALK secondary resistance mutation. So mutations in ALK that prevent ALK targeted therapies from working. This drug and uh, most other drugs um, are that we're looking at are tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Tyrosine kinase region um, of a gene is like the switch of the gene that turns it on and off um, through phosphorylation process. And so when drugs are TKIs, they target that region, which is inside the cell usually, if it's a receptor, um, and they target that region and they prevent um, that drug from the, or that gene from being turned on. Oh. And so crizotinib is an inhibitor of a few different genes um, by its TKI activity, ALK, um, HGFR, CMET, and another one called RON. Whereas lorlatinib, which is a, the newer version that we're talking about today, is also a kinase inhibitor against ALK, but it targets a bunch of other different kind of tyrosine kinase-related targets, including ROS1, type 1, FER, FPS, TRKA, uh, and so on. So it has a bunch of different other targets that crizotinib doesn't have. Um, and that can, while that can provide benefits, it can also provide disadvantages. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So lorlatinib is able to target a variety of signaling pathways that crizotinib does not. This allows better responses and ability to work when or after crizotinib does, does not work anymore. So in the CROWN study, a previously untreated, so this is first line, ALK positive advanced non-small cell uh, lung cancer patients received either lorlatinib or the standard of care 
prasatinib. Um, the primary endpoint of this study was progression-free survival. And what progression-free survival is, is it's a median, and this is a time period where 50% of the patients in the trial experienced disease progression. So it is a median, and it's only 50% of the patients that have experienced progression. So uh, what were the results? So they looked, um, I think the trial went for about 60 months or so, and um, they looked at uh, follow-up um, within that time period, um, and they found some interesting things that the medium progression-free survival um, at that time period was not reached uh, with lorlatidib. NR means not reached. And the five-year progression-free survival for lorlatidib was 60%. So that's pretty good. Uh, whereas for prisotinib, um, the progression-free survival was only 9.1 months. And uh, more importantly, the five-year progression-free survival for prisotinib was only 8%. So this drug has a staggering difference in efficacy. Wow. I'm going to give awesome. you a visual of this. So this is all wow. of the patients in the trial. Um, and as you can see, the red line here at the bottom is crizotinib, and the blue line is lorlotinib. Um, and on the right, or the left here, uh, you can see the progression-free survival percent, and then the time and months. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, pro the, the, the progression-free survival is typically uh, the 50% mark, so that would be right there. And as you can see, if you go 50% right across, it's still not reached at 76 months. Each on one the of these lines is a patient. Mm -hmm. And so if you cross this right across, you can see 60% right up until the end of the trial. Yeah, so wow. Massive, massive dis difference. I mean, if you look at this, this is 10%, 8% at 32 months. So huge difference. Uh, I definitely know which drug I would prefer to be on. Mm -hmm. So importantly, lorlatinib also has the benefit of substantial CNS activity. And that is, CNS activity basically means it's the ability of a drug to penetrate the blood-brain barrier and go into the brain and um, target metastasis or prevent metastasis. So not a lot of drugs have that. Um, if you are choosing a drug, always choose one that has CNS activity if you can. Mm. Um, in ALK-positive uh, non-small cell lung cancers, um, you know, brain metastasis is a significant consideration. Yeah. Um, and so um, what they found was that the time, the time to intracranial progression, which basically means you know, when someone develops a brain metastasis, was not reached in the lorlatinib trial or lorlatinib arm, and it was 16.4 months with the crizotinib arm. Basically, mm -hmm. this is a slide of all of the figures of the different subgroups. Okay. So this was all patients. Yeah. And you can see blue and red for crizotinib and blue for lorlatinib. Um, and then B was patients that had uh, metastasis prior to starting. Okay. And so you can see if you have a metastasis um, before, you know, at diagnosis, if you have a CNS metastasis at uh, diagnosis, uh, crizotinib really does not work that well. Right. Wow. What a difference. Wow. So if you are, so if before you, if upon diagnosis, you already have tumors in your brain, yeah. Then you're going to want to go straight on lalatinib. Yeah, look at that. And you're going to want to bypass prisotinib. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Now, um, this is patients without CNS metastasis, and obviously they're going to do a little better than the overall group. You yeah. can see here the number, uh, even for prisotinib, is higher, but you know, 96% for lalatinib had 60 months versus 92% for the overall group. Now, the overall group included both these, um, but this is patients without CNS metastasis. So if you do have CNS metastasis, you're going to have uh, a great response typically on lalatinib and a not so good response on crizotinib. So crown study, um, of note, the progression-free survival benefit with lalatinib, um, which exceeds five years, obviously, corresponds to the longest progression-free survival ever reported with any single agent targeted treatment, not only in advanced non-small cell lung cancers, but across all metastatic tumors. Now, that's not just the drug. That is um, the trajectory of ALK positive lung cancers. Um, you know, they do tend to have fairly good response to treatments, you know, in general. Um, and they do tend to respond to uh, other generation ALK inhibitors as well. But not quite like this. Not like this. Yeah. So considerations. Um, now, there's some important considerations. And um, when I was looking at this trial, I did notice um, there was a few there was a few studies or a few um, comments about, you know, whether this is the drug to take in your first line. 
And um, there were some interesting arguments. So uh, first off, um, the firstly, the most important thing, um, and I'm going to just cover two considerations here, is that ALK inhibitors, um, there are other ALK inhibitors with their own unique molecular targets. Um, there's a few different ALK inhibitors now. I'm not going to go into the names, but they're, they're you know, um, approved and, and so on. It's really important when you get progression to find out what is causing the progression. And it may be met, it may be a host of different altered genes. Um, and you want to pick the ALK inhibitor that actually targets the molecular features that are causing the progression in each case. So just because somebody is progressing on prozotinib does not mean that lalotinib is going to be the perfect drug for them, although the data does look that way. You know, there may be a better ALK inhibitor for a very specific person. The point I'm trying to make is you need to look at your tumor DNA and RNA if you have a progression, and you can do that through um, liquid biopsies. You could do that through tissue biopsy of a new sample. Um, but you've got to look at the DNA and the RNA to find out what is actually causing the resistance to chrysotinib before jumping in and just taking oil out of it. Okay. Um, the second one, when a targeted drug has many targets above and beyond the intended target. So this drug is designed as an ALK inhibitor, um, but it also targets many other genes. Um, and this is what we call a dirty kinase inhibitor. Um, the classic dirty kinase inhibitor uh, was a drug called regorafenib that we saw. Um, and the problem with that drug is at its actual um, beneficial dosage, it has a lot of side effects. So there are more side effects with lorlafenib as it has this, as it is a dirty tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It may be prudent to use other ALK inhibitors or to use lorlatinib after other ALK inhibitors fail rather than using it in the first line. And so that's the big argument is like, should we just jump right into lorlatinib? And I would say that if you have a earlier stage or, you know, an early diagnosis, a small tumor, um, no brain metastasis, and, you know, maybe going on chrysotinib for a little while and then switching to lorlatinib might be more prudent. Um, but if you have an advanced cancer, and this study was on advanced cancers, and if you have brain metastasis, then um, lorlatinib is definitely the best first-line drug. And so this is an argument that is going to be going on for a long time. You know, some doctors will say, well, let's save our best for last. And other doctors are going to say, no, we want to have the biggest impact on cancer early up front. Yeah, I kind of subscribe to the latter group where like, why would I why would I wait for progression before I do everything I can? Um, I mean, I, but the other thing, really, I think uh, the key point that you made in the in the prior slide is you got to get your tumor tested. You cannot rely on the standard of care that just looks to see if you have an ALK mutation or a ROS1, like just the small, smallest subset um, of targets are looked at because as you say, there are a number of these types of drugs and why not get started on the best thing right oh, away yeah, here? Exactly. Um, exactly. So, you yeah. know, I understand what you're saying. You, you're, and I appreciate that you're trying to caution people against just kind of looking at that long, excellent statistic and kind of overlooking the potential side effects. Um, but again, that this might not even be the right drug for people. They'd have to have their tumor tested to, to make sure sure, or this yeah. might not be the right one for um, to start with, but neither might the crizatinib, depending on what uh, the, the extra details of your tumor. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. a great point. And I think the argument of, you know, saving the best for last is really based on a lack of precision oncology and a lack of molecular analysis. It's kind of old school medicine. Well, it's a, it's actually I've spoken to the folks in the high, the higher up folks in the government uh, uh, about how they decide what to fund when and where, and the the mentality which I empathize with is they have to stretch the resources across the entire population, yeah, and that's the issue. Yeah. 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 So they start with, quite frankly, the the cheapest option that will. Mm -hmm the most people likely. So yep. chemotherapy, for example, we know it's going to benefit about 25% of the population quite a lot um, mm -hmm. and the rest, not so much. So they put everybody on it to start with and then, you know, 25% have a great response. And then as the others advance, they put them on something more targeted or, or, you know, something a, a little newer perhaps. Um, so we do, under, we understand the necessity of doing 
the minimum we can to start with. Uh, but we're talking about you, the individual patient, not the big healthcare system. And it's really important that you understand what's going to be best for you personally, and that you know how to advocate for mm -hmm. that drug, rather than going through all the first, second and third standard of care lines before you get to the thing that's really going to be best for you. Um, that's, that's my two cents. That's my little... Yeah, yeah. yeah great points. Um, so in general, by targeting more cancer-associated signaling pathways, um, you get better efficacy, but you also have more side effects. Mm -hmm. um, and so the side effects of lorlatinib are kind of unique. Um, grade three and four, which are more serious side effects, compared to crizotinib, was largely due to um, higher triglycerides, um, higher cholesterol, weight gain, and hypertension. You know, oh, so those are all serious considerations. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what is important to keep in mind, though, mm -hmm. is that um, when they did dose reductions on, uh, on this trial, um, they found that it did not affect the efficacy. So in other words, yeah, so they could actually use a reduced dose and um, they were able to get uh, the same benefits with a reduced dose. So, yeah, so, you know, dosing is a big issue and it's it's really hard to nail it. Um, okay. So, but this is the good. This is the good news to what we were saying earlier about those considerations with uh, because it's a dirty kinase inhibitor and it has these higher side effects. We can reduce those side effects by reducing the dose without affecting the benefit of the drug. And in previous um, dirty kinase inhibitors, such as regorafenib, um, we found that while they don't have the best single agent activity, because getting that single agent activity means that you have to have a toxic level dose. Um, they're really good at um, synergistic interactions with other drugs. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you can use a really low dose regorafenib and combine that with other drugs to get a you know, much better benefit. And I suspect with lorlatinib, that's going to be the same thing, is mm -hmm. we're going to start seeing some combinations of lorlatinib with other drugs that are going to really be beneficial. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I put the link there, um, the study. Uh, Solomon et al., 2024. That's great. So in summary, for those with ALK positive cancer, there are a number of targeted therapies that are shown to provide greater benefits to patients than the current standard of care, obviously. Um, thorough tumor DNA and RNA testing is so important in any cancer, and especially done small cell lung cancers, um, to identify driving and resistance mutations that need to be targeted. And so you can have the most best outcome. Wow, that's great. Thank you. What an exciting what what an exciting study. What an yeah. exciting turn of events for those mm -hmm. of you with that non-small cell lung cancer and um, the elk positive specifically. Um, yeah. Uh, if you want some help with what's going on for you or your loved one, um, that's what we're here for, aside from making these free educational videos so that you guys can just be as well informed as possible. Um, Alex and his team provide one-on-one -on -one consultations. It's a one-hour Zoom. They gather all your medical records, have a look through everything that's currently known about you and have a look at the most current medical science research and see what recommendations they can make. Um, there's always something that can be done for sure. Um, so that's something that you might want to do if you're looking for options whether you're just freshly diagnosed and you're wanting to make sure you start off on the right foot or you're into your third or fourth line and you're just looking for more options. Um, I've also created a free online uh, educational program uh, called Cancer Just the Facts. We have uh, drop-in um, Q&A and advocacy trainings twice a week and once a month we have uh, a live Q&A that Alex hops on to and answers very specific questions about your case. Uh, so do sign up again, it's free. Uh, and then we have our YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe and stay informed. And thank you, Alex, very much for putting this yeah. together.